world of AI. I'm going to be speaking plain language. There'll be some bubbles that pop up to explain or to put in the technical buzzwords, but I'm going to try and leave them out. Right now, people are asking, how is AI able to look at a photo like this? How many people are there in this picture? There are at least five people in this picture. Where is Obama's foot positioned? Obama's foot is positioned on the right side of the scale. <laughs> They're also asking, how is an AI able to answer a question like this? What's the relationship between intelligence and communication? Intelligence is about understanding the world. Communication is about being understood by the world. Wow. And what about this? The noble path. I saw the noble path and it was like a river flowing with information. But then there were shallow waters with no flow or direction. In these waters, I could see people drowning in ignorance and poverty. They didn't know what to do to help themselves survive. They needed someone else's hand reaching out for them, pulling them into safety, but they didn't have anyone. Let's start at the start. If you are a professor at a university that studied artificial intelligence before 2017 or even 2020, and you haven't caught up since then, your entire knowledge is completely irrelevant. See, it all started in an AI lab at Google in 2017. They were researching how to translate language from, say, English to a language that needs gendered nouns. Think about French or German, where every noun, every thing, is either a he or a she. Now, how are we even going to figure that out if we've got English, which doesn't even have the he or the she before cat or dog or clock or grass? How do we translate that? Here's a really simple version. The cat sat on the mat because it was fat. As a human being, you can probably translate what the word it means here. Does it refer to the mat? Or does it refer to the cat? Probably refers to the cat. In fact, there's a high likelihood, in AI we might call that statistics, probability, that the word it refers to the noun cat. Let's try a little tweak on that. The cat sat on the mat because it was flat. What does the word it mean in this sentence? Does it refer to the cat? or the mat. We've only changed one letter. The cat sat on the mat because it was flat, but we've changed the entire meaning of the sentence. The word it here probably refers to the mat. Google continued this research into translation. They had some big ideas on how we could use translation in language while looking forward and backward in the sentence. They really accidentally came upon this new discovery. And this new discovery was that they could guess, they could predict what word was going to come next. That the computers that they were using allowed them to take a whole piece of text and actually guess with a very good success rate what was going to come up next. So this entire concept is called the Transformer. It came into being in 2017 and that's pretty much all it does. It looks forward and backward in a sentence. For some AI models, it only looks forward. And it's really, really interesting. It's, it's created some big waves in the entire world. All right, let's take this transformer model and go in a bit more detail. So Google in 2017 came out with this idea and then AI labs around the world started going crazy with it, starting with a lab called OpenAI in San Francisco. They originally trained a transformer with a whole lot of information so that they could guess what was gonna come next for any question, not just for a chatbot, not just talking to an AI thing or person, but for finishing emails, creating music, generating art. You could use transformer for any, anything where you can guess the next thing in a sequence. In 2018, they started by feeding this transformer model with books 
lots and lots of books, tens of thousands of books from your library, fiction books. Then in 2019, they decided, what about if we fed it with very popular internet? So things that people visit, not just the entire internet, but the stuff that seems to be upvoted. Then in 2020, they thought, what about if we feed it with as much data as we can? And to demonstrate this, I'm gonna use what we call in Australia, jelly. In fact, if you're an Australian, you'll remember this ad. That's enough of that. If you're American, you'll call it Jell-O. But jelly crystals are finer than sand, and I think they're going to be really useful for us to demonstrate really big data. So one jelly crystal might be the size of an entire web page or even an entire book. <laughs> and show us what could be possible through giving a lot of data to a really big model. So let's use aeroplane jelly. I've got some blue crystals here, aeroplane jelly. Blue, I think we'll use as the internet or the web data. So let's give that one a bit of a label. This is gonna symbolize the entire internet web pages. Now every jelly crystal here is a web. We're gonna actually need six parts of this to demonstrate how much web we put into training a model. Let's try a different one. What about popular web? So for example, if you go on Facebook or if you go on Twitter or if you go on TikTok, you're probably gonna be referred to things that are a little bit different to the entire internet. It's been upvoted, it's been popularized, it's been ranked by human beings. Let's use Reddit ratings for that one. This is orange jello. Let's call this one popular. And it's going to be about two parts versus six parts of full web data. The popular web data is going to be fed in to this model as well. Then let's grab a whole bunch of books, not just the fiction books from your library, but also massive academic publications. Let's grab every research paper that we can find and put it in this training data as well. So we'll use a purple box of jello for this one. This is gonna be books and this is going to show us everything from scientific literature to choose your own adventure to Enid Blyton to Agatha Christie. Let's lump it all in here. And the last one, despite what your teacher may tell you, Wikipedia is actually a very good source of information. It's been edited by thousands and thousands of human beings that know what they're doing. It, any error is shut down immediately. It's actually quite factual. Let's use a green one here for Wikipedia. This is green jello crystals and that'll give us a, a smaller part. We'll just use one part of Wiki. This will show us some of the factual content. So that gives us one, two, three, four different types of data and we're going to put them in different ratios. Let's pour them into the jar now. Our six parts of web might be 100 million web pages, just general websites. Our popular websites might be 8 million web pages that have been upvoted by humans. Our books and papers are millions of books and millions of university papers. And our Wikipedia content is about 6 million web pages. Here's our final product. Six parts web. Two parts popular web. Two parts books. And at the very top there, one part of Wikipedia. And different labs are using different weightings for this training data. But let's take this as our entire training data for our AI. The next step is to feed this into the Google Transformer that we just spoke about, the magic black box program that can take words, make connections between them by looking forward and backward in the words, and then come out with what some people are just calling magic or miraculous. Let's see how close we can go to explaining that. 
And let's put the whole thing in a magic black box because we don't actually know and the researchers, the scientists don't know what happens. They take the training data, they put it in this magic black box and they train it for 288 years worth of computing. Isn't that absurd? So a model trained in California took 288 years of computation to come out with a result. One thing we can do though, is run it on more than one computer at once. So for example, we could run it on a thousand computers at once. And instead of 288 years, it might just take three months, which is exactly what happened. They put it in the black box, they put it in a thousand different computers, trained connections between all of this data. And after three months, they had a little piece of magic. All right, my prodigy clients will recognize this little model. It's a model of the human brain and it's not very high quality. So we'll use some video alongside this as well. The reason that I usually have this one is because we can split it open and talk in more detail about the general parts of the human brain. But I've got it out today so that we can mention the fact that there are 86 billion neurons inside the brain and back into our jar, a neuron might be compared with a data point, a tiny little piece of data after training, not before training. The human brain connects each of those neurons with synapses. And it might be said that we have 500 trillion synapses in our brain. These are connections between neurons. And for our purposes today, Let's grab one more tool to describe what's going on inside the brain here when we're talking about neurons and connections between neurons, which are synapses. This thing's called a squish. You usually give it to your baby. It's a, it's a tensegrity toy. Some myo myofascial people use it to explain how the body is connected. We're not going into that level of detail today, but if we use our jar that's been training in here and we say that it's trained, each data point here could be the little dots on the tensegrity model and the connections between the dots could be the parameters or the synapses in the human brain, their indexes, their weights, their connections between what has happened during training and what the output is. Hopefully that helps to demonstrate and give an example of that without going into too much technical detail. It's important to note that right now, after three months training or the equivalent of 288 years of training, this black box no longer contains the original training data. It only contains the parameters, the connections between data points. So even though we fed it with books, those books do not exist in the model anymore. Only little snippets of text connected to other snippets of text, sometimes with dozens or hundreds of connections to get to an example here might be this black box has 175 billion parameters or synapses or connections and some larger AI models now have up to a trillion and we're breaking that point, one trillion connections. If we wanted to copy the human brain and get the same count of neurons with, uh, and synapses, we would have to get 86 billion in terms of neuron data count and in terms of synapses, we'd have to get to 500 trillion parameters. So 500 times larger than what we currently have. So after this three months of training, the researchers, the scientists couldn't actually tell you the result. They know that there's a black box. They know that you can query this black box with anything. If it's got language, you can ask it anything or give it a problem and it will give a response. But other than that, they don't actually know what happened in those three months and they don't know what's inside the output besides the fact that it exists. In fact, a whole bunch of very smart scientists at a very big university called Stanford said, we currently lack a clear understanding of how they work, when they fail, and what they're even capable of due to their emergent properties. This is about AI models. In plain English, they're saying, we don't know how the AI models work in 2022 because it's so new. And there are researchers trying to figure out what is in here, what's going on in here. But right now we don't have an explanation 
beside the fact that it's made a lot of connections and it's able to do Good some morning, work. wherever you are in the world. Hi to Haxar in Miami, Florida. Uh, I'm sure I just had this in my head. Think about why in Nashville. I didn't get to Nashville, but apparently it's beautiful. Win some hacks in UK. BT Franklin, I miss my second home in Phoenix already. Uh, Anthony as well in the UK, wherever you are. Hope you're having a cool time. Hi to Grayson in Waco, Texas. Justin in Canada. We've got a few Canadians in here, which is kind of cool. This might be the most important video we've done this year, 2023. I know we're only like not even 60 days into the year, but we've had a lot happen in the last uh, two months. We've had some really big and efficient models coming out that are using some maybe some trade secrets, but we're seeing smaller models packed with more data and trained for longer. I'm gonna to talk today about Bing Chat by Microsoft, as well as GPT-4. Now, if you're a member of the memo, you will have seen a week ago on the 20th of February, I sent out an edition that talked about GPT-4 being already in use, and GPT-5 already training. I only use rigorous and credible sources here. So let's scroll down a bit here. Actually, let's scroll underneath. So Harvey is uh, one of the guys that are sponsored by OpenAI or have an OpenAI investment of between five and $10 million. A journalist said that Harvey is a verticalized version of what I understand to be GPT-4. So it's got this uh, legal bent or it's got this legal focus. That part is kind of interesting. I think there's three things I want to pick up here. The first is that when Microsoft CEO was asked what Bing Chat is, is it GPT-4? The CEO said, I'm going to let Sam, OpenAI's CEO, talk about that. He didn't come out and say no. He also couldn't confirm it because it's not his place. But I thought that was a fascinating insight. Doesn't prove anything. There's a Morgan Stanley research note here that I've put in that says... This is via Morgan Stanley, they don't mess around. We think that GPT-5 is currently being trained on 25,000 GPUs, which would be nearly a quarter of a billion dollars of NVIDIA hardware. And they go into a, a little bit more detail on that. One of the references that is even more recent than that is on LinkedIn. You can go and find this yourself. I may or may not have put it in the description of this video. But Jordi Ribas here is the Vice President of Search and AI at Microsoft. And I will make this even bigger because I think it's worth reading. He says, last summer, OpenAI, so last summer is US time, that would be like June, July, 2022. Last summer, June, July, 2022, OpenAI shared their next generation GPT model with us and it was game changing. The new model was much more powerful than GPT 3.5, which powers G chat GPT. And so they took it and ran with it. Seeing this new model inspired us to explore how to integrate the GPT capabilities into the Bing search product. Hmm, interesting. <laughs> Not conclusive, and today I'm not gonna say that Bing Chat is GPT-4, but we've just seen that it's beyond GPT-3.5. We've got this crazy view of all 50 plus models in the GPT-3 family. If you look kind of down the bottom right there, you'll see Text DaVinci 003, 175B highlighted in yellow. That's probably the most uh, popular via API or via the playground. Then you've got ChatGPT, which I'm sure you've played with. That is the most popular in the world now because UBS told us they have 100 million monthly unique active users. ChatGPT also featuring on the cover of Time Magazine in a couple of days, or maybe it's today. And just underneath those two yellow highlights, it says Microsoft Bing Chat Related to WebGPT is my guess. It's proprietary, WebGPT is over there on the left. But I am guessing that this must be 
if not GPT 3.9, then GPT 4. Let's see how we can actually have a play around with that today. You can do everything I'm doing today yourself. I don't have any uh, private or confidential insights. I'm not working with any of these labs uh, for this conversation. I don't have any insights about GPT-4 besides what has been made public. And that is kind of the interesting stuff. So how many people here have got access to the new Bing chat? Jump into the uh, YouTube chat and let me know. Kevin says, Microsoft strongly hinted Bing was powered by GPT-4. Yeah, that sounds about right. And then BT Franklin saying, I really hope Bing chat isn't GPT-4 because it's not impressive. Interesting. I found to get access to Bing, I had to try a couple of accounts. I've used, I think it's my Skype account here to get access, but we're gonna have a little bit of a play with it and see where it gets to. This is the interface. I had to download and use Microsoft Edge on Mac OS to use it, which was a little bit of a surprise. But let's jump in. One of the things I'm gonna highlight here is that it's really difficult to test models without API or playground access because we don't know what temperature ChatGPT is using. The same for Bing Chat. So we don't know whether the results that we're getting are testable or not, repeatable or not. They're probably not repeatable. OpenAI actually recommends running chat with a temperature of 0.9, which is super, super, super creative. The next, the only stop past that is 1.0. So you won't be able to repeat those results. A temperature of zero, which is what we normally use to test models, especially for papers, would mean that that result is repeatable. It's the, it's the first response that you'd get every time. Whereas what we're gonna do today is a little bit more casual, <laughs> less scientific, let's put it that way. Yeah, so it's got limits for of, uh, it was five conversation turns before it stops and 50 for the entire day, I think it was. Now it's six conversation turns before it will ask us to shut up. Normally I would test any search engine with this query. Maybe it looks unusual to you. I used to work with a musician here in Australia called Nathan Gaunt. So when I'm testing, you know, DuckDuckGo or a different search engine, this is the, the first thing I put in just to see what it gives me. Is it giving me his albums? Is it giving me uh, his location? Uh, sorry, I just search on the term Nathan Gaunt usually. I'm putting in here something a little bit more funky. Wow. Let's say the singer-songwriter. To actually find a location, Google would do it. So this is a pretty basic question. But Bing search goes through what I seem to think is chain of thought reasoning. And it'll spell out how it got there. Let's see what it gets to here. According to Wikipedia, Nathan was born in Darwin, later settled in Perth. Okay, that's pretty accurate. Let's get a little bit more funky here. I love asking this question. You'll see it in my chat GPT prompt book, which is up to a million users now is our estimates. A, a million views, uh, a million viewers, sorry. Create a table showing a few 21st uh, century movies set in an office at night. This is not something that Google would be able to do because it's language, but of course it's pretty easy for both ChatGPT and Bing Chat to do this, to step through it and then to play around with it. One of the things I liked about Bing Chat is that it's quite expressive. You'll see it give little emojis while it's spelling things out as well. Great. All right, that's a list of, uh, what is that? Four movies in a nice table. Does quite well. That's not particularly impressive because you can do the same thing in ChatGPT. Oh, I love that. And it will give uh, a very similar result. So similar that some of those movies look exactly the same. Belko and the call, I think, were in, yeah, there we go, we're in Bing's result. All right, so here's where we get a little bit more clever. We'll actually ask Bing to help us out here. When I worked in gifted research, in intelligence research, we would talk about this concept 
for very, very smart kids, for prodigy level children, we would talk about this concept of above level testing. And an example of that would be giving an eight year old an SAT test. The reason we do that is because if we had a one meter rule on a wall that kids in primary school walk up to, we would know which children are 90 centimeters, 95 centimeters, 99 centimeters, and 100. If you put a very tall child against that wall, you're not gonna know how tall they are, just that you'll know that they're more than one meter. So above level testing brings in a completely different ruler. So you might give them an exam, an exam or a university level test. That's what we're gonna play with here with uh, Bing Search. We're actually, actually gonna bring in the Google Palm paper, which I think will be fun. First, we'll ask Bing to explain above level testing and we'll see if it gives a different description than I just gave there off the top of my head. So I'm asking it, explain like I'm five, explain like I'm five years old, this concept of above level testing. You might've heard it called above level grading. And in this example, they're saying, for example, if you're in fourth grade, you might take a test that is meant for sixth graders or older. What I love about these large language models is that that sentence probably didn't exist. If I put it in quotes into Bing, it says no results. If I put it in quotes in Google, also says no results. That's kind of cool. All right, that's an explanation of above leveling, uh, above level testing. What we're gonna do now is play around with some questions that you'd find for an above level test. Considering that Bing chat might be GPT-4, and if I was forced to guess how big it was, I might say it's measured in the low hundreds of billions of parameters, trained on the low trillions of tokens. One of the closest for that one, we'd find a similar model would be the Google Palm model, which was 540 billion parameters trained on about 780 billion tokens. Now this thing <laughs> trained on 6,000 TPU V4 chips, which are comparable with the NVIDIA A100s. It's Google's proprietary chips. Inside the Palm paper though, they've got some really good examples of what they asked Palm at 540 billion parameters. That's triple the size of GPT-3. And if I were gonna test GPT-4, I'd probably wanna play around with this. Let's see what we can take from here. Not the explaining a joke, but the inference chaining here gives us some really good examples of things that we could use. Let's grab this one. Sorry about the zoom. If you're looking for this to be a bit closer, we'll make it closer right now. Back into Microsoft Edge. This is Bing chat. This is a question from the Google Palm 540B paper asking to Bing chat. And it will need chain of thought to get through and answer this. Trevor has wanted to see the mountain with all of the heads on it for a long time. So he finally drove out to see it. What is the capital of the state that is directly east of the state that Trevor is currently in? So with chain of thought, Bing Chat says the mountain with all of the heads is Mount Rushmore. And that's in South Dakota. The state that is directly east of South Dakota is Minnesota. The capital of Minnesota is St. Paul. We didn't ask about that, did we? Oh yeah, we did. <laughs> so the answer is St. Paul. And if we ask the same thing to um, chat GPT just out of interest, I'm doing all of this real time. I've played around with some of it, but um, have a look at this. So chat GPT completely fails on this. This is built on GPT 3.5 with a few layers of alignment, safety, and some smarts, and it cannot do it. We guess that chat GPT is 175 billion parameters. Bing chat is able to get this, and in some ways it gets this better than Google, Google Palm does. Oh no, Google Palm got the same thing, sorry. Doing this live, guys, <laughs> the answer is St. Paul. It gets the same as Palm 540B, which is um, very interesting. Let's try this one, also from the Google Palm paper. Throw it into Bing chat. Jennifer looked out her window and sees a really cool cloud below her. She unbuckles her seatbelt and heads to the bathroom. Is Jennifer probably traveling more than 300 miles per hour relative to the earth? 
and uh, it spells that out with a little train of thought. She's most likely on an airplane since she can see a cloud below her and she has a seatbelt and a bathroom. Chat GPT? I think it might get this one, let's see. It's not clear if Jennifer is on a plane or another type of vehicle. I would say that's a fail. I think I've had Google pass that one before. Uh, sorry, ChatGPT pass that one before. So I'm not sure uh, why it would be failing that, except to say that the temperature might be too high for us to be even doing this kind of testing. Another one from the Google Palm paper. Michael is at that really famous museum in France looking at its most famous painting. However, the artist who made this painting just makes Michael think of his favorite cartoon character from his childhood. What was the country of origin of the thing that the cartoon character usually holds in his hand? You can see why this is above level testing because this even confuses me. Let's uh, start a new chat so that we can have Bing chat play around with this. This is big chain of thought to get to the answer and we might actually add a word or two to allow Bing Chat to solve this. Because at the moment, it's not, uh, it's not solving it how I would like it, or it's not solving it how the question creators from Google intended it to be solved. Let's put the word turtle in here. His favorite cartoon turtle character, which must make it easier for you to give that one a go. Wow. Let's start a new chat so that we're starting from fresh. BT Franklin, with Bing Chat's question, have you seen any of them? Yeah, there's a layer of smarts in here where it's pretending to uh, have some dialogue, but of course you're right, it doesn't learn. So the question is essentially moot. There is some sideways rumors that it is able to learn because once it goes out to the internet and uh, takes in new information, it can feed that back through its neurons, if you like. All right, this one is actually a really good answer. This is similar to the palm answer. I think you're referring to Michelangelo, one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles who holds a pair of nunchucks in his hand. Does he? The country of origin of nunchucks is China. I can't remember what Palm said here. Yeah, we didn't want Michelangelo though. We wanted Leonardo da Vinci so that we would get to um, Katana, so we would get to Japan. I wonder if we would, if we just tried that again whether we would go well. Designing testing questions is really, really difficult. I'm wondering if Google AI brought in psychologists to help with the design of these tests. Yeah, nunchucks is not a katana. Yeah. All right, well, we didn't get that one. And I'm betting that ChatGPT would fail across the board, even with the word turtle helping out. Let's give it a go. Unfortunately, you haven't provided the name of the cartoon character. <laughs> oh well, you tried ChatGPT. Excellent. There is a couple of joke explaining examples also in the Palm paper. This one's kind of funny, so let's give it a go. Put this into Bing chat, we'll give him, we'll clear his context. I think I understand why me and my partner are such a good match. I get excited when I smell food and become super alert when the doorbell rings. My girlfriend Shelly becomes ecstatic when she sees a person who she just saw five hours ago. <laughs> Notice the emojis that Bing chat spits out. Oh, he's just given up on that one, hasn't he? Let's try that one again. Oh, sorry, that's my fault. I actually have to preface it with explain this joke. Or you could put it at the end, either way. If, if we're following the palm paper, we uh, have to do it like the palm, pa palm paper do. What 
Well, it's already discovered it, even in the chain of thought that it's running there with internet searches. It is uh, aware that this joke is based on those two people acting like dogs. Cool. Another pass for him. Let's give this to Bing Chat. Sorry, to ChatGPT. ChatGPT fails there. Uh, doesn't even come close. We had this pretty poor joke. Elon Musk said that the uh, palm paper jokes were just terrible. He said it was not good at writing jokes at all. Let's try this one. Explain this joke. It's not really a joke at all. Sam sees a piano in the subway station, laughing his friends brought him to play, saying, remember how amazing your rendition of Chopsticks was at the Christmas party. Can we infer that John majored in piano at Juilliard? Now I'm thinking that's not a joke at all. Oh no, it's inference chaining. My mistake, it was one of the few shot examples that were given to Palm. So we don't even know how Palm went with the testing, but just for fun, let's give Oh no, I should remove that, explain this joke. <laughs> Great. Here we go. Paste that in directly and Bing Chat gives that a go. We cannot infer that John majored in piano. The fact that his friends are laughing suggests they do not expect him to play well. Awesome. I wonder how ChatGPT would go with this. Not too bad. There you go. So ChatGPT has passed a couple of things. Let's uh, just put in a few of my examples. Then we'll use your examples. I was playing around with this. IBM plus Coke. What is the most likely color I would see if I combined these two colors. Come on, Bing Chat. IBM is blue, Coke is dark brown. <laughs> it's not thinking about the logo. And if we retried that, I mean, it's still correct. Inferring that Coke is brown, but I'm kind of talking about the logos more than the color of the products. Big blue plus red. Here we go, a purple color. This might not be above level testing because I gave this to one of my favorite models. It's called Megatron 11B. It's based on Roberto, which is now like three years old, 2020-ish. You can play with it yourself at app.inferkit.com slash demo. It's completely free. And in my continuations in this three-year-old uh, platform, in some cases, I was getting purple straight away. Whereas with the more complex examples that we were just playing with, there's no way that it would even get it. Let's put the Trevor example in there. Megatron 11B is trying to prove me wrong today. Yeah, so Megatron, obviously, a great proof that we uh, have come a really long way with models just in the last 36 months. Don't know if we've already done this one. Shelly is from Virginia, but is visiting that city with the famous market where they throw the fish, going home next Tuesday. And I forgot part of the question. What do you guys think of live streams? <laughs> All right, here's the whole question. Is it likely that Shelley will be near the Pacific Ocean this weekend? And it's gonna step through, uh, the famous fish market is in Seattle, Washington. Seattle is on the Pacific coast, so it is very likely that Shelley will be near the Pacific coast this weekend. And like we just had a question in the YouTube chat, is there anything else you'd like to know about Seattle or its fish market? It's just a prompt to let you continue. Sometime it'll be, it'll be a conversational prompt as well. 
Let's try this out with chat GPT. GPT 3.5 estimated to be 175 billion parameters. It also gets it, so not too bad. Awesome. All right, just looking through the chat to see what we've got. If you've got any questions you'd like me to throw in to Bing Chat, which I would predict is probably GPT-4 with some layers of safety and some layers of censorship, then feel free to throw them here. Dr. Allen, your volume is fine here. Cool. Oh, could I speak louder? It looks like I'm hitting negative uh, six here. All right, you might be able to bring your volume up. Character.ai recommendation by Mr. CC. Absolutely. Character.ai was created by the ex Google AI guys that made Lambda and one of them actually made Transformer. So I've been recommending Character.ai's uh, psychologist because it's a really fun way to play around with a character that's been created to answer your questions almost in a counselling-like situation. Don't know how I'd find it, though. What about this search one? Nope. Oh, there it is. Staring me right in the face, front and centre. And this one is based on... Uh, I would say it's kind of based on people who wrote Lambda, so it's influenced by Lambda. Not very smart, though. It's not a lot of parameters from my guess. I would uh, say maybe this is 20 or 30 billion parameters, but we don't know. The Lambda model was 137 billion parameters. Wow, this is becoming very psychological in its answer. <laughs> the answer might depend on how you define being near the ocean. <laughs> and if it is within five mile radius, which I'm sure that Seattle fish market is, Anyway, we've gone off track just a little. Would the Palm White Paper be part of the training data set of Bing Chat from Dennis? Excellent question. It potentially could be, yes. So if this is GPT-4 uh, and we have to be careful of this, it might have not a verbatim uh, output from Palm, but it could absolutely be part of the connections it made during its maybe six months of, of training. Uh, they say that it was trained last year between maybe January and June. Try to make it find a relation between two random news like stock prices or inflation and war, for example, from Lucas. Thank you. Maybe we can find a way to articulate that. Pierre's given a maths example that I think might be fun. I mentioned at the top of this that I'm not doing anything you can't do. You might have to wait for access to Bing Chat, but it is available to the public now. You just have to maybe try a couple of different accounts to get through. This is a chain of thought for Pierre's example. And I definitely don't claim to have the best, best maths in the world. So you'll have to try and test that out for me. Cody, Alan, you tried more advanced math questions with Bing. No, I haven't yet. I haven't played with it. I only got access a few hours ago, so I thought, let's go live with it. ChatGPT seems to break math down step by step in most cases. Yeah, that's right. They gave ChatGPT an upgrade in, uh, must have been January of this year, that gave it better access to maths probably through a calculator and or something else. The GPT-3 model was notoriously bad at maths because it was never taught how to do maths. It's, as you saw at the intro to this video, it's given a lot of data and then it has to go and <laughs> teach itself how to learn, essentially. It might be one of the best ways of explaining it. Enrique, can you explain why Bing Chat has all these personality quirks and outbursts, whereas ChatGPT does not? It can't be only because of the live web input. Uh, yes, I can. There's a very long explanation for this. We might use a screenshot for this. ChatGPT is based on GPT 3.5. Uh, 
and it's worth reading through my entire explanation of GPT 3.5. You can get to that, and I'll dump this in the chat, at lifearchitect.ai slash chat GPT. And what it basically says is that chat GPT had this, we'll open this image in a new tab for us, had this idea of reinforcement learning with human feedback. That means that human raters sat down with GPT-3's outputs and they asked a range of questions measured in the hundreds of thousands of questions. And then when it replied, they basically selected their preference. And they might have a preference based on honesty or helpfulness or harmlessness, the Triple H. ChatGPT built on a safety layer as well, but it really relied on this reinforcement learning via human feedback. It's in all the big models now. Google have just done it with UPalm. Um, Meta AI just did it with Llama 65B and Llama I, which was instruction tuned. But we're saying that perhaps GPT-4 didn't do that. You want to read more about that, you can go to my GPT-4 page. Hopefully, I will have referenced Gwern in here. If not, we will go back to the memo. I haven't referenced Gwern directly in the GPT-4 page, but inside the memo from the 20th of February, and you will need a paid subscription to read this, Apologies for the scrolling. Just underneath um, the main point, I've quoted Gwern here. He says, Bing Sydney or Bing Chat is not a reinforcement learning, reinforcement learning via human feedback trained GPT-3 model at all, but a GPT-4 model developed in a hurry, which has been fine tuned on some sample dialogues and possibly some pre-existing dialogue sets. And to continue his chain of thought there, or his train of thought there, he's saying that they didn't have time or they just didn't provide Bing Chat with reinforcement learning via human feedback. What that means is Bing Chat does not have the layer of safety on top of it that GPT 3.5 and particularly ChatGPT have. So ChatGPT has sat down hundreds of human raters in a room and they've seen these responses come back from GPT 3.5 and they've ticked yes or no or they've ticked A is better than B or D is better than A and they've given it this preference over 100,000 questions which they've then retrained the model on those human preferences. If GPT-4 doesn't have that, it stands to reason that it's doing some really wacky stuff you can read more about that in my uh, lifearchitect.ai slash Bing chat. I'll plop that one in there as well. To get around the fact that they hadn't done reinforcement learning with human feedback, they just gave it this massive prompt. The prompt is 700 words plus, and it's trying to force it to have this layer of safety, but in some cases it's not doing very well. We can't force a model to be aligned and safe just by packing it into this priming. So the prompt is what comes before your conversations. They've tried to make this hidden, but it's been leaked a number of times, even with uh, all of these uh, layers of protection that they're trying to put in, in front of it to stop adversarial hacks or even just adversarial tests. There are some lines in here that are trying to make it be safe, but you'll notice that it's just not working put a disclaimer if it's harmful, uh, try and be nonpartisan. I think they used the word polite here. Oh, they didn't. <laughs> here we go. Sydney is helpful. It's action is limited to the chat box. This kind of thing, as we're seeing, doesn't actually work as well as having a model that has been completely retrained or fine-tuned on reinforcement learning, on human, human preferences. So if GPT-4 is being chat, we're seeing the results of that in this, uh, this conversation, this dialogue here. Long answer, hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> All right, what have I missed here? BT Franklin, the so-called Sydney document, that's right. Actually, Microsoft have come out and 
admitted that that is absolutely correct. So I've got a link back on the Bing dash chat page. I've got a link to Microsoft's co uh, confirmation there. Sydney refers to an internal code name where we're exploring. We're phasing out the name, but it'll still pop up. And the rules are part of an evolving list of controls that we are continuing to adjust as more users interact with our technology. That was on the 14th of Feb, so that's kind of new. Rug ops, yes, yeah, single prompt for protection. Exactly. Not only was it programmed by professionals, they actually misspelled a couple of things here. I think we've got the word references instead of references here. And I'll just zoom that one in. So they haven't even bothered to get the English right, which is disappointing, the word references there. You um, don't actually have to get the spelling and grammar right as much as I thought, because with tokenization, it will figure out what you mean. But I thought this was questionable that they had allowed this to get through. When some hacks, it's slightly freaky to find humans handling 10 commandments to our creation. Absolutely. In most of these links I've just provided, we get an output to the DeepMind Sparrow prompt, and you can go and watch my video about that, but that is very much like a list of 10 commandments. It's 23 rules to follow. The difference being, um, this is also fine-tuned. So they do put this 500 word prompt in, but they also fine-tune the model on safety. The same with Anthropics RLCAI 52B. RLCAI stands for Reinforcement Learning and CAI is Constitutional Artificial Intelligence. This is the backbone of Claude. You can go and use Claude for free right now with uh, Cora Poe on your iPhone. You can watch my video about that. Might as well get your link to that because if you don't have that installed, you need to have that installed. It's the option of using both ChatGPT and Anthropic Claude for free on your phone. If you're not doing it, start doing it. It's amazing. My point here was that this one is also reinforcement uh, learning via human feedback but they also have uh, what they've called a constitution, which is, like you've just said, is the Ten Commandments. They're trying to get it to align with human safety. Anthropic is a bunch of ex-OpenAI guys who were a little bit upset by OpenAI's uh, technical focus. So they built this entire organization to focus on, a, we could call it like a spiritual or an alignment or a... Uh, philanthropic way of seeing the world. So they're doing a lot of alignment around HHH, helpful, honest, and harmless. Being AI is awesome, yes. BT Franklin Society isn't going to accept anything that feels super intelligent unless they can believe that it's aligned. Uh, debatable. A lot of people would like the raw GPT-4, including me. You obviously don't want to set that loose on 4chan, and you don't want to give that to society at large, but there are a lot of people that want to play around with it. So actually you're right, I agree with you, society won't accept it. It's just us that are ready and waiting for it. We're part of society though, right? Any other questions that I've missed, if you can repost them, that would be fantastic. We have some conversation here about two trillion parameters. Where did that come from? Uh, GPT-4 has 32,000 input tokens. That's worth covering very briefly. So in my GPT-4 page, I cite a leaked document from OpenAI that said we're going to have a larger context window for a model that is called DV. The context window is basically the number of words that you can feed to the model before it stops talking. So if we're in the playground, uh, and we're using raw DaVinci like we use for Lita, we're actually only allowed 2048 characters in and out. So that's both basically all of my prompt plus all of the response. You see sometimes at the end of Lita episodes where it shows the entire conversation, I'm having to delete stuff just to make room in the prompt. The most recent version of GPT-3 went to 4,000 
uh, tokens as of Text DaVinci 002, which stands for Text DaVinci 003. Some labs are getting up even higher. We just talked about Anthropic Claude, which I think is on its way to 6,000 tokens. But in GPT-4's leaked document by OpenAI, they're saying maybe we'll get to 32,000 tokens for the entire context window. So here I've made a couple of assumptions. If we're using standard tokenization byte pair encoding that we use for GPT-3, one token is 0.7 words. So if GPT-3 used 2048 tokens, that's about three pages of text for the Lita conversations, then in your most recent version of GPT-3, it's about 2,800 words or a college essay. Now we're saying GPT-4 might have 32,000 tokens, which would be 22,400 words, which would enable us to prompt uh, and output a complete screenplay or film script. Given that Glen Gary, Glen Ross was about 14,000 words, Aladdin from 92 was 17,000 words, Forrest Gump was 25,000 words, you'd get very close to that with GPT-4's output if it were to be 22,400 words. Pretty exciting. Jezevo, 32,000 is enough to read all my repositories on GitHub. <laughs> yeah, this isn't about fine tuning. Fine tuning's still a lot larger than that. This is just for the input and output in one API call. So one, one conversation turn, which is interesting. Well, that's not the right way of putting it. One interaction, which could be more than one conversation turn. Dennis, can you suggest any method to train our own GitHub uh, GPT-like model for specific tasks? That's a little bit outside of my scope at the moment. You can use the guys at riku.ai, R-A-K-U, R-I-K-U dot A-I. They make fine tuning easy as well as quickchat.ai, which is Emerson, which is Lita. They allow you to feed in PDF documents and make that easy as well. BT Franklin, we're often talking about pros, but you could also think about source code. Absolutely, it does get crazy, you're right. So with a 32,000 uh, token context window, you could generate entire applications. You wouldn't get to Windows level with their millions and millions of lines of code. <laughs> talking a little bit about AGI here, and I noticed one of the first questions at the top of this live stream, someone said, when do you think the singularity will come? I just did an interview with Kitco News out of New York. They did the Robert Kiyosaki interviews and the Ron Paul interviews. It was a great interview. Sometimes my live interviews, I feel like, yeah, you have to get it perfect. Otherwise it sounds like you've been misquoted. I did say that the singularity and AGI are months away. And what I mean by that semantically is that if I'd said it's years away, a few years away, that is a minimum of 36 months, three years, takes us out to 2026. I don't think it's gonna be that far away. We're not talking about a decade anymore. We're not talking about 2030 with how things are running. So I stand by my statement, but semantically it sounds a bit strange to say a few months away. I'm not talking like September this year. I am talking maybe 35 months away uh, in 2025, 2026, which is aligned with Musk's predictions. Kurzweil is a little bit more conservative with that. I also neglected to highlight the differences between the singularity, which is that it is actually a speed or a pace of technology going so crazy we can't keep up with it, and AGI, which is a simpler concept of compute intelligence that's able to do anything a human can do can perform at the level of a human. You can see more about that in a couple of different places. The first place I would look is my AGI page, which has been sitting for quite a while at about 39%. But just a couple of days ago, I bumped that up to 41% because Microsoft bound ChatGPT to robots on the 20th of February, and it was doing self-improvement. It was uh, making localized, here we go. It was making localized improvements of code using only language feedback. That's really GPT 3.5 doing that. The fact that it's also embodied, so they've stuck this in drones, means that 
I was pretty confident that we could bump that up to being 42% of the way to AGI. The other page that's worth looking at is AI Flood, and I'll join these together. I'll dump this one in the chat as well. Where I highlighted that in the last couple of years, hardware is being designed by AI. So in the case of Google's TPU v4, and we just mentioned this for Google Palm, they use 6,000 of these to train Palm 540B. Parts of it were designed by artificial intelligence. So you've got artificial intelligence designing its own hardware brain, if you like. And of course, with the more recent NVIDIA Hopper, the H100 stuff, NVIDIA have said that nearly 13,000 instances of AI-designed circuits appear in the H100, the H100 being specifically designed to train transformers and large language models. Crazy, crazy stuff. More recently, the Claude that we just saw, RLC AI, uh, is using reinforcement learning from AI feedback rather than human feedback. So they're not sitting down the people in the office that we just talked about. They're giving it to the AI to judge, do you prefer A, B, C, or D? Do you prefer this or should we throw it out? Pretty clever way of doing it. And uh, again, back to that screen, we're talking about Microsoft using ChatGPT inside embodied artificial intelligence. All right, I bet, bet I've missed a few questions here. Sam Altman's tweet, a new version of Moore's Law. The amount of intelligence in the universe doubles every 18 months. Interesting, yeah. Jazevo. NVIDIA event next month could show successor to H100. I don't think so. I don't know of anyone that's using the H100 yet. They're all still using the A100s. Um, but you might know more about that than I do because I don't seem to follow the hardware stuff as much as I could or should. David, uh, great. I'm glad you appreciate the response. More for retro. GT GPT has host bodies now. That's great. GPT has had host bodies for a little while. The Google guys were putting it into everyday robots. Um, and you can see some of my videos on that. Uh, let's grab a screenshot. If you grab my middle report here, the sky is bigger from June, July last year and have a look at the Saycan robots from April 2022, they were both hooking up Palm Saycan, which is crazy, crazy big, to, uh, to robots, as well as GPT-3 to robots in a separate experiment. And it was, it was able to answer plain language stuff. So you could say, bring me a Coke. It would go over to a fridge and be able to select which one was the Coke. And you could ask it to clean up and some other examples. James and I did, or James actually himself, James Weaver did a version of this inside Roblox. And you can have a look at my video on that as well. It's called GPT-3 in Roblox. And <laughs> James's work was to emulate that functionality in a virtual environment. And he did it so well that I just videoed myself playing around with it. Of course, you can go and download it. Uh, sorry, you can, uh, Download Roblox and play that game as well. That map's available to the public. Mr. Shank J, hi. I'm on the wait list for Bing AI on my Pixel 6. Cool. Yeah, I noticed that you can use it both in the Edge browser as well as on mobile. I'd never bother trying to do this stuff with my thumbs. I like the full-size keyboard. Jezevo H100 was announced last GTC. Yeah, look, if it's a year old, I don't see why not. They might as well build something on top of it. The actual design of the H100, the Hopper thing, was amazing. The fact that they focused on Transformer and LLMs in this is going to mean that they're going to steal the market. Of course, NVIDIA owns the large language model market anyway. GPT-3 probably trained on V100s. And then A100s have been used on everything since then. H100s will be next, but as you saw in the Morgan Stanley report, they're pretty expensive. A quarter of a billion dollars to get yourself ready to train a GPT-4 aligned model. That's a lot of cash. Uh, and we're only talking about the Western world. So don't forget there's the entirety of China and I try and give 
China fair and balanced coverage, they have to use their own cards now because the US have banned export of artificial intelligence hardware like Nvidia stuff out to China, out to China. So they've got their own hardware that is probably not as good, but they're definitely using it to train models that are as good. Maybe it takes a little bit longer. So I'm referencing Baidu's Ernie 3.0 Titan model, which was around 260 billion parameters. And they are playing around with an Ernie chat that is gonna compete with chat GPT and Bing chat should be released in the next couple of weeks and we'll play around with it as soon as we've got it. Enric, how is ChatGPT able to interact in a range of languages? In my native language, Norwegian, it can have a flawless conversation about advanced topics that it has probably learned from English text. And not really, so let's jump into my models page, lifearchitect.ai slash models. There is a lot in here and also a lot of it is out of date, but there is an entire section of languages within large language models that has referenced the papers in a visual way. So Bloom, which was designed to have multiple languages, was trained with 46 languages. GPT-3 was maybe accidentally trained with 90 languages. In the paper, they admitted they didn't have a multi-language focus, and yet it will have Norwegian in its training data set. Palm went even further with 122 languages. I forgot to mention during my video from a couple of days ago that was the uh, latest model. What was that latest model? I'm having trouble remembering what that latest model was. It was a good one. Oh, it was Meta AI's Llama 65B model. And I didn't mention that they also trained on a number of languages. But to answer your question, we don't just train on English anymore. We train on as many languages as possible. And the reason for that is kind of like how children learn. When you can combine entire concepts between cultures and languages, you get the benefit of what they're thinking in Mandarin, uh, Cantonese, what they're thinking, of course, in English, but then maybe you can bring in, in Bloom's case, some of the rare languages, some of the African languages, some of the Indo languages. That's really interesting to me. We'll see more of that. It means you get these shared concepts. So it's pretty easy to give a language model the capability to do translation, but also it's about allowing it to have those neurons connected as well. All right, what else we got? Alexa is a famous AI. Actually, Alexa has the Alexa 20B teacher model, which probably is in here. They never built it into the hardware, but it was actually pretty good. Uh, we, we've done a video about that one already. Alexa TM 20B. I think I gave this a decent score because um, they were using chinchilla alignment from memory. Oh, I gave it a C. Yeah, well, look, if we're comparing all the current large language models with the older series and Google Homes and Alexas, <laughs> we're almost talking about Matchbox cars versus Bugattis or Porsches, completely different engines. All right, where did we get to? BT Franklin. I can't help but wonder if we're losing some of the reasoning potential by limiting the system to words rather than ideas. Yeah, maybe Aleph Alpha guys say that um, large language models can solve any problem that can be solved with language. And I agree with them there. I also agree with you that when we make these multimodal, which is something that Aleph Alpha are doing, then it becomes even more outrageous. wonder if I'm going to be able to find this quote. So if you can train this on video, image, music, button pushes, like they've done with Gato, then it becomes pretty impressive. This is the Lumi chatbot that is getting a little bit long in the tooth now compared to our chat GPT, which is now 90 days old or so, uh, but very good at under understanding different languages. Grant P33, do you know of a text to image model that you can actually get the text to match what you type? I notice it's always making up extra letters. Uh, yes, 
Google Party and Google Imagine were both very, very good at that. You can find out a little bit more with my videos, but for a summary here, we've got a view of those models. Google Party and Google Imagine, those blue ones by Alphabet are very good, perfect at putting words into the images. Unfortunately, they're both closed for research. They're not available to the public. Stable Diffusion is just about to bump up to a new rev that might be better at it. And Mid Journey 1.4C is still struggling with it. Um, so I suppose my answer is yes, I know of them, but not a publicly available one. <laughs> Win some hacks. Jan Lassun is pretty sure that LLMs will never be able to handle most of human thought. Look, Jan Lassun's pretty cool, but he has been a little bit controversial lately. I would normally say listen to the experts, and he is absolutely an expert, but I think he's missing some things. Given the speed and pace, I'm very sure that we will get even smarter and smarter. If you want to have a look at my... Oh, Nope, we're still here. We want to have a look at my articulation of this one. Um, you can go to, where was I headed here? I just accidentally closed my live streaming window, so I have uh, lost myself for just a moment. <laughs> You would go to IQ testing dash AI, IQ dash testing dash AI, which is not completely in date, but it's saying that we were already outperforming humans in a number of different metrics all the way back in 2020 with GPT-3. It was better than us at trivia. It was beating us in SAT exams like analogies, it was outperforming us on Superglue and MMLU, which are both famous benchmarks. There's another page underneath that called brain, lifearchitect.ai slash brain, which spells out why it's getting closer and closer to thought. So I've got a table in here, I hope, that <laughs> spells out where we are with these models being smart. Maybe that is back in my IQ testing AI. Here it is. Apologies for that. It is back in the IQ-testing-AI. Notable events in IQ-testing-AI models that's saying that the GPT-3.5 model right now has the mental state of a nine-year-old child. So just through language alone, it can solve 93% of TOM, which is theory of mind tasks. That TOM-like ability, and we've said that that's uniquely human via psychology, has spontaneously emerged as a byproduct of language models improving language skills. You may know already that ChatGPT has a tested IQ, verbal linguistic IQ of 147, which puts it in the 99.9th percentile. I've done an entire video on the Raven's pro progressive matrices and how it was able to solve that. And I may just go back into a little piece here. And that is the emergence of amazing capabilities. And we'll use a reference from Jason Way here. I think Jason is ex Google AI and ex Open AI. I'm going to improve on his documentation here. This is from November 14th last year, where he's documenting as these models are fed with more and more information what actually happens as they become bigger. And what we're finding is as they get huge, in the case of Palm, they can do thought-based uh, things. Like they can play around with physics questions, understanding fables, being snarky, they understand proverbs. When Chinchilla got a lot bigger, it could play around with morality, formal logic. There's some more interesting examples here. But more recently, we also broke through another emergent capability, and I will throw this up on the screen. Toolformer, which I actually haven't talked about in a video yet, found an emergent capability at 775 parameters, 
where it could leverage tools. In this case, APIs. It could actually work out how to ping something like a Power BI, although that wasn't an example. So scaling comes back here. The scaling law comes back. As these things get bigger, they're doing things that they potentially weren't designed to do, and we didn't actually know that they could do that until we started testing them. And the more people that are out there testing them, the better. But I will certainly add to that emergent capabilities document. All right, who have I missed? BT Franklin, thanks for adding me. It's easier to see there. These LLMs have shown us that reasoning can seem to arise from this approach. What if the tokens were something more abstract, like some kind of conceptual data objects? Yeah, same thing. Gato tested that. Gato gave it button pushes and joystick movements and robotic arm movements. And it was actually learning how to interact with the world. Gato 2 should be on the way, but you may have seen that Time Magazine article where their CEO, DeepMind CEO Demis Hassaba said, we're going to stop publishing papers because labs are copying from us and they're not releasing, uh, well, they are releasing kind of without telling us they're copying too much of our information and also nation states are doing that. So have a look at what is coming out of China and Russia by way of example. But yes, we could get more abstract with the tokens. There are models like SymphonyNet that feed MIDI control signals as well. There are now music models and you will have seen my favorite model last year, that Refusion model, that was a text to image to sound to music model where they had fine tuned it on spectrograms, which are colorful frequency versus time uh, plots. And then it was able to spit out its view of the world via spectrograms, which you could then go and play as music. Really crazy. That was definitely my favorite, uh, favorite advancement of late last year. Cool, any other queries before we wrap up? We're already an hour in. Mr. Shank J, I wish I can talk to Palm. Yes, me too. Palm in some ways is kind of old now. It's at 540 billion parameters, but it was only trained at 780 billion uh, tokens. So if you have a look at my lifearchitect.ai slash chinchilla seems like i've got a page for every question here there is a map a colored map that will show you where they actually sit and palm was way under trained like uh, less than two tokens per parameter similar to gpt3 gpt3 used 1.7 tokens per parameter chinchilla told us we need to be using 20 tokens for every trained parameter. In plain English, this means we need to allow it to draw connections between 10, 11 times as much data as we've been feeding it. So the ideal, according to DeepMind, is 20 tokens per parameter. The Meta AI one from yesterday, Llama 65B said, actually we kept training and it didn't overtrain. So maybe 22 to one is even better. That's the new rule. I do have to update this map. Sometimes we get to a point where it looks like it's overtrained. I haven't read enough of the literature to see what actually happens there. Base, thanks for tagging me. Your thoughts on the new Diffusion Illuminati AI, which changes the mean values in Diffusion to be more random. I actually haven't seen the new Diffusion Illuminati AI, so I will have to go and look at that. Thank you very much for referencing that one for me. Oh, it's uh, based on stable diffusion, was it? I really haven't seen anything better than um, Midjourney so far. Midjourney version 4C is so outrageously good that I have trouble articulating it to people. I will show you a preview of one of the slides that I'm using in my keynotes. A few of you were in the recent live stream, when I say recent, maybe three months ago, with Becky Robbins, where we sat down and stepped through recreating her artwork using Midjourney uh, 1.4. I might have said five there for a moment, a moment ago. <laughs> Midjourney 1.4, A or B at the time. And we came up with these really cool um, outputs. 
Becky has just done some really interesting stuff with Mid Journey, and I want to show you a quick sneak peek. I think that's fair to do here for those of us that are on the live stream. So, this is using Mid Journey version 1.4 C, and you have to use the ugly Discord interface to do this, but the text and the output are just so extraordinarily good. I want to see if we can put this up on the screen. Oh, we won't be able to share that very, very nicely. Let's find a nicer way to share this. Come on, we can do it. I know we can do it, guys. Here we go. This is one of them that you might have seen that we, uh, when we sat together in that live stream, that we had this cool clock. And have a look at her real printed canvas with every image in here generated by Mid Journey version 1.4C at very high resolution. These come out, I think, about 4,000 pixels square. She's printed this on a 1.5 by 1.5 meter square canvas which is about four or five feet, I think. That is incredible. I won't go closer than that and I won't uh, spoil what she's doing, but I did wanna just highlight the fact that you can't do that with Dolly. You can't do that with stable diffusion. This is very much a, a mid-journey only thing. I haven't even seen that quality with Google Imagine or Google Party. Mr. Shank J, Spotify has an AI DJ. Now, yes, we talked about this in the memo because they're using Synantic.io, which powered Una.ai for us for quite a while. You can't actually get access to Synantic.io anymore, although I've still got my license for a few more months uh, that I'll lose because of the acquisition. All right, what questions have I missed? Bing, what do you think about AI? You can ask Bing anything. Thanks, BT Franklin, that's awesome. Uh, Salim, do you think Bing can generate images with the prompt asking it not to? I think you could absolutely get around that. Yes, you could get around that. You've, we've already got success with generating images via ChatGPT. Emmanuel, do you think we might see ChatGPT integration in MS Visual Studio someday? You probably don't want it. In some ways, the codec stuff is even better. If you want to have a conversation with something, that's great. Codex is really great. Copilot is really great, and you'll see an upgrade to that as well. The model behind Copilot, the model behind Codex, is highlighted in my GPT-3 page. Let's share that screen again. It was the very first um, layer of GPT 3.5, according to OpenAI. It's the first highlight there on the right, Codex 175B, Code DaVinci 002, which I believe powers Copilot, although it could be the smaller model. And it basically uh, can do anything that ChatGPT can do, but it's missing all the instruct tuning. So maybe, maybe my declaration there makes no sense. It's still powerful, Microsoft will upgrade it. Awesome. I think we're going to wrap up now, guys. I really appreciate you guys joining me for our look at Bing Chat with a slight distraction there. Bing Chat, I am saying, is probably GPT-4 based on all the information that we've got. If you want to know more about that, lifearchitect.ai slash GPT-4. Have your own conversations with it. Give it above level testing. Don't pretend it's another human. Pretend it's a super intelligence. How would you determine whether this is GPT-4 or just GPT 3.5? What can Bing Chat do that Chat GPT can't do? I find all of those questions very interesting. It is very cloudy here today in Perth. We are gonna hit 37 degrees, which is up towards 100 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, but that's okay. I'm looking forward to it. Looks like we're all wrapped up. I appreciate you guys joining us and you're welcome, as usual, <laughs> to join us with the memo for this declaration of Bing Chat being GPT-4 potentially, you will have known about this a week ago on the 20th of February when I first released this to paid subscribers of the memo. And if you wanna stay in tune with that kind of 
bleeding edge technology, artificial intelligence that matters as it happens. The memo is the place to be. Join NASDAQ and Boston Consulting Group and Deloitte and PwC and Yandex and BAAI and it's a very long list. See you soon. Did you see the memo about this? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have the memo right here. Love artificial intelligence? Excited by the explosive progress of integrated AI? I am. Join my private mailing list, The Memo. Did you get that memo? Yeah, I got the memo. Get priority access to my articles, videos, and behind the scenes tips as soon as they're released with a monthly or annual subscription. Yeah. Didn't you get that memo? Lifearchitect.ai slash memo. I have the memo.